All right, everybody. So, we have some questions to answer today already. And I made the mistake of putting them in the description. I can't see this description from here. Let me see if I can remember what they are or maybe get to it from some other section. The problem is when I'm streaming and I try to go back onto YouTube from here, it chokes up on me. So let's see if I can do this. Maybe I can access this. That's something to keep in mind, right, for next time. Don't put, okay, I, can, I, I got it. So there's two questions. What can happen if my lips, to my lips if I don't rest? What happens to my lips if I don't rest? So I have a, a, a video about resting, how important it is to rest. It's called the, the three levels of rest. And in that video, we talk about the beat level, the hour slash minute level, and the day level. And this question was specifically about what happens to your lips if you do not rest at the beat level, okay? And the qu my answer to the question, and it's going to make it sound kind of weird, but we'll, 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 uh, Explain this, okay? The bottom line is I don't know what happens. I absolutely don't know. I know what the results are of what happens, but I haven't figured out yet uh, what exactly happens to your lips. I don't know what happens to your lips. I know what happens to your playing. Not quite the same thing. Do you see what I mean? So when I say I don't know, what I mean is I don't know what happens to your lips. Your, your question was specifically what happens to your lips. And that might be my fault. Maybe in the video I said something weird happens to your lips. Um, so my wording might have led you to, to, to ask your question that way. But bottom line is I don't know what happens. I don't know if it's inflammation. I don't know if um, I, it could even be just mental. I don't know what it is. I just know that the weirdness that comes out of it has physical manifestations, regardless of whether the, the cause itself is physical. The weirdness is physical. Okay, so let's let's talk about what those things are. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to recall past students in my head that have had this problem. Uh, for me, it's been way too long now. Okay, so for one, okay, one of the problems that you'll have if you don't rest at the beat level is you'll have really really poor response. What is response in the, in the context of trumpet playing? You try to play the note, and instead of a note coming out, it's like, right? You have, you have like fuzziness come out first, and then a tone. But it's worse than just that. If you don't do beat level rest, everything you do on the horn feels hard. It's like, it's sort of like, you know, when you have, uh, I think this is a thing, right? When you have those nightmares where you're running through mud, right? And like, no matter how hard you try, you're still running like a, a, at a turtle's pace, right? Snail's pace. That's what everything feels like when you, when you don't rest your lips between, Okay, and here's the thing. This is why it's so weird, right? I have students that do the other two levels of rest correctly. In fact, they do a whole bunch of it, right? They'll do the day thing. They'll split their sessions up like they're supposed to. But because they're so impatient, they don't do the beat level of rest. They want to play, play, play. A lot of them are adults, and they don't get a lot of time to practice. 
So they want to they want to milk every minute they have, and and they don't want to rest at the beat level because they just want to squeeze more practice time into that amount of time that they've got. And what's weird about that is they could take a whole week off after that. And, and this is why maybe I think this might be a, a psychological thing. But if, if it is a psychological thing, it has real physical manifestations. So, so they could practice for an hour one day, take a whole week off, practice another hour a week later, take another whole week off, come to my lesson. And they have all those symptoms that I'm talking about of somebody who did not rest the way they were supposed to. Now, if it was just a fatigue thing, you would think a whole week off would, would um, fix the fatigue. And in every case, just, just, and I know this is anecdotal. It's, this is not scientific. This is, and for those of you that don't know what anecdotal means, it's basically saying, according to my experience, it hasn't been proven scientifically, right? So my anecdotal experience says that this is a thing. And it doesn't have so much to do with endurance or uh, fatigue as it has to do with something weird, and that's why, uh, this is probably why he was asking the question, something weird happens. Weird problems start popping up. Now my, oh, and then my student, oh, this is why I said anecdotal. My student will come in, and then two or three weeks later, after having practiced with the correct resting, will no longer have those symptoms that I'm talking about. And that's what I mean by anecdotal. That's not proof for everybody that this is going to be true for everybody. No, of course, that's not proof. But it's been consistent for every student I've taught. Okay? And, you know, that's, to me, that's a big deal. That's a big, it's so much of a big deal. I figured this out. When did I figure it out? I figured it out in the mid nineties, this whole resting thing. Um, actually, no, it was earlier than that. See, I didn't used to do this. I used to be one of those people to plaster my horn on my chops. And I would even keep it on my chops to turn pages, right? Now, in theory, in theory, okay. Let me let me tell you what I used to believe, and I, I'm not sure I believe it anymore. Okay, that's this is why. Uh, in the '90s, this is how I used to teach it, and I, I'm only thinking of this again because we're talking about it. And I told you about the '90s, and I'm like, oh, the '90s. That's when I used to say blah blah blah, right? Um, in the 90s, I used to tell my students about um, tourniquets, right? I was, a, I was a scout, and when I was in scouts, they don't do it this way anymore, but when I was in scouts, they used to tell us that if you had either a snake bite or a compound fracture, that's compound fracture is when the bone goes outside the skin and now you're bleeding, right? You would put a tourniquet around what it, whatever limb it was that had that, and um, to keep it from going. You know, in the case of a compound fracture, you don't want the 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 blood to just like drain out of your body so you die, right? Um, so yes, Anthony, I can. Um, I can explain tight corners, okay? I have I have a, a kind of a unique story to tell about tight corners. So um, anyway, so th they taught us about tourniquets, but here's the thing about tourniquets. They also tell you don't leave it on. 
a tourniquet is only a, a temporary solution. And this is probably why they tell you today, don't do that for a snake bite. You know, there's different kinds of snakes anyway, right? That's probably not the best thing for every kind of snake anyway, right? So, but the thing is, if you have a tourniquet and you leave it on, that, let's say you put a tourniquet here, your arm will die, okay? And I, I used to teach teach that to the students about the tourniquet. So I haven't taught that in a long, long, long time. But imagine what happens if you practice for two hours. And, and you put the mouthpiece on your lips and, and you're one of those guys that changes pages like that. And you leave it on there for two hours. That's like having a tourniquet on your lips for two hours. And so, so one thing we know for sure. Um, one thing we know for sure is that if there's no blood flow to the lips, that's not good. Right. And and yes, you might you might be thinking to yourself that you take it off every once in a while. You know, some of you don't take it off at all. Like me, like I used to turn pages like that, right? But some of you, some of you don't even take it off. And 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 those of you who do take it off sometimes don't do it often enough and for long enough. And even though that part of the lip won't necessarily die, aren't would you not agree with me in saying that there's different levels of dead, right? I mean, we know that about the whole body. You can be brain dead and your body's still alive, right? So what to say that there aren't different levels of 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 death inside the lip as a result of keeping the mouthpiece on there and not letting the blood flow through. You see what I'm saying? So that's really what, and, and so I, I said earlier that it might be mental. And the reason why I think it might be mental, more mental is because of the fact that you can go a whole week and it's still there. You go a whole week and it's still a, a whole week of not playing and it's still there. So that's something to, to think about. Anyway, I hope I answered that question. I'm going to get to you guys' questions just as soon as I answer this other question. Um, any tips on improving upper register? And now this is very specific here about notes getting thin and starting to crack as you go into the upper register. That's the other question we got before the session started. And my approach to range is a use it or lose it approach. Um, I would strongly recommend my one range book. So my one range book deals with this. Uh, look up uh, Eddie Lewis, One Range. I can actually send a, a link to my book page. But the way, One Range book. So here's the thing. Why am I telling you about a book? Uh, and I know uh, music business people will be saying, you know, that's what you got to do. You got to do this stuff and, and pitch your stuff, right? But the reason I do this is because I don't think Fixing problems like that can be a knee-jerk reaction answer, right? Um, you see this on Facebook all the time. Okay, I'm putting a link here. Now, for those of you who are watching this later, it's in the. Ch I put the links in the chat. Okay, so and you can get to the chat. Um, if you're watching this after the fact, you can get to the chat. Uh, by clicking on that thing. Maybe you can't get to that on the phone. 
Uh, I'm not sure about that. Anyway, that link goes to my Trumpet Books page. And on there, you'll see the One Range book. The One Range book talks about the philosophy. Now, the reason why I, I, I quote, unquote, promote that book in answer to this question is because it's not a simple answer. Okay? I think, oh, I was telling you about what I see on Facebook, right? We got on Facebook. Someone says, someone asks a question like that, right? What do I do? To improve my range, my notes crack. And you'll get these answers. It's 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 predictable, right? More long tones. <laughs> right? They'll say more long tones. Make sure you practice pedal tones. The other well, no, we're not talking about the same people, right? The people who believe that long tones make you play high. Or, or, or will fix your high notes. Those are a different set of people that think you should practice the Arvin, <laughs> right? Practice the Arvin. There's people that uh, practicing the Arvin is the answer to everything. Um, and then there's people that will say that you need to do more lip slurs. There's people that will tell you to do the, um, what's that guy's name? Cat, Cat Anderson, 30 minute G, right? And, but these are all knee-jerk reactions that have nothing to do with your question. All right? Those are knee-jerk reactions. They haven't put any thought. It's, this is something that's been programmed into them. If, if question A comes up, then question B is the answer. Okay? So the reason I promote my book in this context is because there isn't a knee-jerk rea uh, uh, reaction answer. There's no such thing. This is not possible. It's not possible because each and every individual is different. And my book is not set up in a way that says, um, uh, the book, by the way, the book doesn't have exercises in it. So if you're not a reader, it's not a hard book to read. But if you hate reading, you probably don't want to get the book, okay? Um, and, and I don't mind, like, summarizing the book a little bit. Um, but really, the, the, the book lays it out very well for you. Basically, what you want to do is use the range you already have without going above your range. Now, how do you know what range you already have now? The way I do with my students is if they can't do the long version of my routine without getting tired, then they're not there yet. Okay. So, um, so that's the first thing is use the range that you've got and you want to use it in your exercises and you want to use it in your music. If you're not doing both of those things. And that's one of the things in the book I talk about the importance of practicing music, not just exercises. If you're not practicing music, that might actually be the problem. Oh, you know what I was telling a student the other day? You know, I just finished telling you that it's, there's no one knee-jerk answer, right? I was telling a student the other day, it's, he, he's a saxophone player. He's not a, 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 a trumpet player. He's a sax player. I do cheat. I do teach jazz improvisation lessons, and he's taking jazz improvisation with me. So, um, and we were talking about this very subject where each individual has has to come to this stuff on from their own direction. And so the question was, why do I teach all of my jazz students out of the same materials up until a certain, certain point? After a certain point, we don't do the same materials, but, but for like the first depending on how fast they go through it, the first year of their lessons is the same material as every other student. But the reason it's like that, it's not because that's the material they should work on. It's because that material is set up that way so that we can systematically find what's wrong with their playing. I'm not saying that's the stuff they need to learn how to do. The, the reason why we have this... this um, spread 
of exercises is not necessarily so that they can be good at those exercises, but so that we can pinpoint exactly where the weaknesses are. Okay? So it's not... I think a lot of people think that if you have all the same materials for everybody, then you're teaching them all the same. And that's actually the opposite of what's going on. I do use a lot of similar materials, but it's because we're looking, right? We're, we're, we're looking for the mistakes that we're going to deal with. Then once we find those mistakes, that's when it gets personal. Okay, that's when we, once we, once we analyze and and detect a, a, a flaw in the in the student's approach, that's when when we start having a more personalized um, a, approach to this. And and in the context of the one range book, the reason you want to want, read the one range book is because maybe there's something in there that you're not doing right. It's not. It's not, thou shalt do this and you will get... No, it's not about that. It's about, look through all these things that I say in that book. And there's there's a chance that you're doing something actually the opposite of what I say. Right, for example, I believe you should take one day off a week. One full day off a week. That's the part of the three, three um, levels of rest. I think you you should take one full day off a week. And this this sax student that I'm talking about, he's a sax player. He doesn't need to take a full day off, right? Not for his chops, but it's not just about the chops. It's about your head too, really, and your heart too. It's about putting trumpet in the right place, putting music in the right place in your life, right? So that's the first thing I would say is that you want to do the one range approach. Now, what else did I, the one range approach also talks about doing my physical trumpet pyramid warm up. Okay. Uh, you can look up online, you can look up the stuff about my warm up stuff. Um, and there's a reason why that's part of it. There's something that happens when you do your exercises in that order. I tell you how to do that without buying my, um, my own warm-ups. You don't have to buy my warm-ups for you to do the routine in in a way that um, works with the one range. You can take the exercises you're already doing and modify them to fit this approach. One of the reasons why people will decide after they've read the book to go ahead and buy my routine books is because it's just a lot of work to do your own stuff, you know, because the routine stuff that you have now is probably not going to work with my system. You have to modify it. So, like, for example, if your scales, let's say you have a range up to G above high C. I mean, not, not G, above, G above the staff. I'm sorry, G above the staff. But you practice um, C major scale. <laughs> You're not getting the full range. You need to use your full range. So if you're doing scales that don't go up to G, you need to make them go up to G. And like I said, this is assuming your range goes up to G. Okay? You need to go up to G. If you have tonguing exercises that don't go up to G, like, for example, the Clark... The Clark, um, there's a, in the Clark characteristic studies, there's a whole page of articulation studies. I think it's like that. It's been years and years and years since I played that. Um, but there's a whole page of those where he just switches the articulation. What's wrong with that? It doesn't go up to G. Okay, it goes up to E. You need to modify that so that it goes all the way up to G and all the way down the low F sharp. 
if you do, if you do, um, lip slurs. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Doesn't go up to the top range. Okay. You need to modify that. Now, here's another thing that I say, though, is you don't want to go beyond your range because when you do that, you're going to start doing things wrong. Okay. So that's, that's a problem. All right. Now, I will say that one of the best ways to get plugged into my system of, of improving your range is to get started with the tonalization studies. Now, one of the things we're working on right now is publishing all the different levels of the tonalization studies. We have, I think we've published, we've got the, the, the one up to E, we've got the one up to G, we've got ones up to high C, and you just, so the, the reason of tonalization studies are so good for your range is because you're getting strength in your chops that's practical. You're not just getting, you know, there's a lot of people that can play high that can't play high, right? They can play high notes. But if you give them a part, they can't play the part. And... That's because they, when they practice in that range, they're not practicing stuff that gives them that, that ability, that skill. So like, so today I did my scales up to E above the staff. <laughs> I did 20 exercises like that. I started on the root note. I went all the way up to high E above the staff, went all the way down the low F sharp, and then back to the root note again. I do this on a daily basis. Okay? It just happens that today is my E day. Um, I don't practice the same range every day. That is also in the one range book. Okay? Now, the, the first half of the Run Range book tells you about the concepts behind it, the One Range approach. The second half of the One Range book gives you uh, an exact strategy to implement that in your own playing. Okay? So, now, if you don't have time or don't want to do the One Range book, um, you can get started with a lot of this stuff just by doing your scales, the tonalization studies that way. Okay. Now, let's talk about some of these other questions. Can I explain keeping tight corners? And I said that I had uh, my own own story to tell. You know, the the, the tight corners thing. I used to think, it for, okay, so I was taught the tight corners thing. And then later, I thought, well, this, hey, this tight corners thing, that's not a thing. And what happened with me is I think that after doing something for years and years and years, you don't realize you're doing it anymore. And I had to remind myself that when students first start, they don't have that strength yet. Now, how do I approach tight corners? I don't. I don't think we should be thinking about that at all. Okay? I think if you do lip buzz as a daily rudiment, just a little bit of lip buzz. You don't have to do a lot of it. And that's one of the things, you know, one of the things that makes my routine books work is that I get the ratios right. How much of each exercise should you do? It's possible to do too much of some exercises. Lip buzz is at the top of the list of exercises you can do too much of. 
okay? If there's any risk of doing an exercise too much, it's the lip buzz that, you, that has a risk of that, okay? Um, so the, the any of my routine books have, so Kwaku is asking um, what book has the lip buzz. Any of my routine books have lip buzz. So that would be the Daily Routines book, the Chops Express book, or any of the Trumpet Chops books. Right now, we only have three Trumpet Chops books out. There's Chop, Trumpet Chops Tyro, which is sort of a beginner book, which goes up to E in the staff. And then there's Trumpet Chops um, Player, which goes up to e above, uh, G above the staff. And then there's Trumpet Chops Pro, which goes up to C above the staff. That's high C. And each one of those will have lip buzz in it. Um, so if you do lip buzz as a daily rudiment, it, it trains you exactly how much tension to put. I see sometimes, not necessarily in my students, because my students do this, right? My students are, well, they're supposed to. <laughs> Some of them don't. Uh, but my students do the lip buzz on a regular basis. So they get exactly the right tension in the corners. It's possible to do too much. It's possible to do too little with the tension. Sometimes when I'm working with someone who's not my student and they're, they're conscious of the corners, right? And they'll be trying to play like, you can even see it on their face. It's like, oh, like, you know, trying to, to do that. And that is not efficient. When we talk about efficient trumpet playing, that's what that's part of what i mean by efficient okay efficient trumpet playing is actually something i actually that's contradicts what i said earlier on something on another video it's a different kind of efficiency okay so like um anytime you have muscle opposing muscle groups whether they're pulling against each other or pushing against each other, um, you're going to have wasted energy. Okay? So that's a, a different kind of... Uh, just to clarify how it contradicts what I was talking about in a different video, that's a different kind of um, efficiency. So... Um, anyway, so that's what I have to say about tight corners is, is if you want to know exactly how tight to make them, do some lip buzz. Do that on a regular basis and you'll just, it just happens like naturally. Um, now, Kwaku is asking, can I please help get stamina back and good tone? Okay, so when we say get it back, what was it before? So, um, how 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 far has it gone down? Like, are you down to half of what it was before? Down to a quarter of what it was before? Um, because if it's severe, if what you're if what you're asking is severe, then something you're doing is wrong. Now, this is something we talked about, I think. No, this was a lesson. So I've gotten, gotten, getting this stuff jumbled up in my mind. Um, I think it was a lesson, not a video recently. I was talking about this recently um, with a student talking about sound, okay? When it comes to tone, there's two parts Oh, trying, I see you're a comeback player. Trying to play again after 15 years. Okay. Um, well, okay, so that's a different question. That's a different question. Well, let me finish up what I was going to say about tone. Uh, getting a good sound. Now, good sound, and, and there's a lot of good teachers out there that will teach you good sound, right? They'll teach you what you have to do. And that's a good thing because those things are pretty consistent 
right? The error thing is is pretty consistent. What um, not having um, like too tight of a corner or too loose of a corner. Those things are consistent. So and and for me, the way I teach that stuff. If you want a good sound, number one, the number one most important thing for getting a good sound is that you listen to people, listen to trumpet players' recordings at least that have a good sound. And you need to do a lot of that. Okay? Now, that's the first step. The second step is that you should follow this um, this this warm-up thing that I'm talking about. You do the specific exercises in the specific order. Because, you know, for example, we were just talking about the lip buzz. The lip buzz gives you exactly the right tension, exactly the right tension in your lips for making the embouchure. It's, it's now... Have to be careful with that. Because, you know... When you add the mouthpiece, the the muscles in your face can relax a little bit more. So I, I, I kind of misspoke because I said exactly the same tension, but I'm not saying that it's it's let me reword that, okay? The lip buzz helps you in the moment discern exactly what the right tension should be. Okay, let's put it that way. Because once you add the, the, the mouthpiece, what feels right changes. So I guess by saying, doing the lip buzz, it helps us facilitate finding that right lip tension. Okay, so by doing that on an everyday basis, you're now having a, a, a very, what am I saying? By having a doing this on a daily basis, you're having a daily reminder of exactly what lip tension you need, and you need that to have a good sound. Okay, and it's, and by the way, that will also help because you're asking about stamina too. The doing this stuff is going to help your stamina. Stamina comes from two sides. Okay, stamina comes from building your muscles up. But it also comes from not wasting the strength you have. That's the efficiency thing. If you're not efficient, you can have strong muscles and not be able to play. Because the muscles are fighting against each other. Okay. So, so talking about getting a good sound, we want to have, do the listening, do the routine. Then the next step is to play in tune. Most of the time when you get a bad sound, it, 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 okay, okay, so let's clarify that too. Sometimes your tone is okay. Sometimes there's nothing wrong with your tone, but your sound is awful, right? They're not the same thing. So if I play the major scale, I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna go slow. Okay. When I played that scale right now, I allowed the pitch, the intonation on each note to move up and down. The tone itself was good, but the sound of a pitch that isn't stable makes it sound awful, okay? Does that make sense? You want to have it in tune and, and not just moving into pitch, but hit that pitch and hold that pitch. When we hear a great sound, it's because that person is locked into the pitch, when I play like that, there's no variation in the pitch. Now, there is an exception to that if you're trying to play jazz after you've mastered being able to play it straight in tune, 
then you can add some effects by changing the pitch. But that's, I would consider that for jazz stuff. If you're trying to learn the trumpet, learn how to control it first and then do that stuff on purpose, <laughs> right? Don't just do it because you can't not do it, okay? Um, anyway, so yes, that's the next thing is make sure you play in pitch. All right, that's that's my main approach. Now, one other thing. So I guess we would add that as another. Okay, so so far we've said listen to a lot of trumpet players that have great sounds. And by the way, if you're listening for that purpose, don't listen to players that have a bad sound. And how do we know that they're, they have a bad sound? Um, if it sounds any worse than me, and by the way, I don't want you to listen to me, okay? Don't listen to me for that. I've said this many times on these chats, okay? Don't listen to me. I don't have the best sound out there. And that's not just me being humble, okay? I'm not just being humble. I don't have the best sound in the world, okay? I have my sound, and I'm, I'm proud of my sound, <laughs> okay? And that's why I have that listening list on my website. Go to eddielewis.com and look for my listening list. There's a YouTube list of, of players, classical players, that have a great sound. In fact, let me... Let me post a link here now. Don't listen to me for that. Now, I'm not telling you don't ever listen to my music, okay? If you like my music, listen to it. And there is actually, indeed, a lot of good reasons to listen to my music. Just don't listen to it for that. I hope that makes sense. Don't listen to it for that. Okay, listen. Okay, so I'm, I'm posting the link in the chat. Okay, that link will take you to my listening list. These are players you want to listen to because they have that great sound. Now, if you're talking about things like, I think one of my best qualities as a player is phrasing and melodicism and stuff like that. If you want to learn that from me, you can listen to my recordings, okay? Um, but if you're listening for the purpose of um, improving your sound, don't listen to my recordings, okay? Anyway, um, um, and there's reasons why my sound is not as beautiful as some other people's sound. It has to do with physical properties in my lips, okay? Um, that's not just an excuse. This is just the way it is. Now, once again, I like my sound. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not that I don't like my sound and I'm just being, you know, um, self-defeatist here when I say that. Okay. Oh, so anyway, I was going to say the, the, the last part, the last step I would suggest is also learn about the, the, about phrasing and stuff like that. Because a lot of times what we hear when we think it's a bad sound is just that somebody doesn't sound good, right? So anyway, I'm, I'm getting taking a long time to say this. Um, so if you follow those things, you would think that that would give you a, a great sound. And I spent a lot of time talking about that and I, I got kind of off from what I was saying because what I really wanted to do was contrast that with what really happens in the lesson. Because like I said earlier, there's a lot of teachers that teach that part of it really well. But there's something missing. You could do all those steps. You could do the listening. You could do the, a, a, a proper routine. You could play in tune. And you could do musical phrasing, and you could still have an awful sound. And this is where some of the other guys don't get it, okay? Some of those other guys don't get it. What, what, even though you do all that stuff right, there might be something you're doing wrong, okay? There's, 
maybe five things at the most that you need to do to get a good sound. But there's hundreds of things you could do wrong <laughs> that could make you have a bad sound, okay? Let that sink in. I'm going to say it again because this is important. There's like five things you have to do to get a good sound. But there are literally hundreds of things you could do wrong that would give you a bad sound. Let's give you one example. If you have chapped lips, it can give you a bad sound. Has nothing to do with those steps that I showed you, right? And you could be doing those steps perfectly. If you have leathery chapped lips, you're not going to have as good of a sound as somebody that has soft, supple lips. You know, I had a, a student one time uh, and uh, very, and I, uh, and I don't mean this jokingly, right? Because I'm, if it wasn't for trumpet, I would be the same way. I enjoy being around masculine men because I want to, you know, the, I don't know, what am I saying? Um, that's the way it should be, right? That's just how I, 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 I appreciate that is what I'm saying because there's not enough of that out there, right? So he's in the, he's in the lesson. And he's, you know, he's a very respectful man. He's about, I don't know, I think he's 10 years older than me. Very respectful man. And I told him, I said, I said, because he came in with really chapped lips. And I said, you're going to have to put some stuff on there. And he said, no, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I said, why not? He says, only women put stuff on their lips like that. I said, well, you know what? If you want to play this horn, <laughs> you're going to have to start now, right? You're going to have to start now. Um, because <laughs> it's going to make you sound bad. And that's just one example. And like I said, there's hundreds of these that could happen. There's hundreds of these things that can happen to give you a bad sound. And that's where I come in as a teacher. You come in here, you tell me I hate my sound. First thing we're going to do is make sure you're doing those things. Here's another thing, right? Maybe you're doing all those things correctly, but you're not following the three levels of rest. That's one of the things we talked about earlier, right? If you're not following the three levels of rest, that will also give you a horrible sound. You could be doing the listening. You could be doing the routine. You could be doing the uh, the intonation. You're still going to have a horrible sound. Okay? So, so that's not something that you're doing right. That's something you're doing wrong. Right? Okay. So I hope that makes sense. And, you know, this stuff is hand in hand. So a lot of this, the, the other parts of your question that you were asking about in the context of someone trying to come back. Now, let me, uh, let me tell you this. My routine books are based on the structure in my routine books came because I thought I was going to have to take months off from the horn right after I changed all my approach. And I didn't want to forget how I was doing this. I thought for sure if I went to to this thing for, for three months, four months, that I would come back and I wouldn't remember anything that I had done. So I wrote it all out. And that's where the structure comes from. The whole point of these routines was to get me back after that time off. So th these routines have helped hundreds of students come back after like what you said, 15 years. Those books are designed for that. I'll tell you again, it's the Daily Routines book, um, Chops Express. Now, the difference be da between Daily Routines and Chops Express is how long it takes. So you, so you ask yourself, how long do you practice? If it's an hour or less, 
Do you want to buy the Chops Express book? If it's an hour or more, then you want to buy the Daily Routines book or the other books, the, the Tyro book, the Trumpet Chops Tyro, the Trumpet Chops Player. Um, that's for if you're practicing over an hour per day. Um, and you know what? The same thing applies um, The if you buy the One Range book. The One Range book explains to you See, the, that's the nice thing about the One Range book. All the other range books are exercises that you have to do, and most people can't even, if they're struggling with range, they have trouble even getting through the first steps, okay? My book doesn't have exercises in it. My book tells you what to do, how to, how to fashion your, your routine, your, your daily practice habits, so that so that you um, make progress from where you are. You could have a range that's, I use, just to give you an example, I use the same approach. You know, sometimes when, when early, early, early students start, like let's say they're just uh, fourth grade, sometimes they don't have the range to play in the staff yet. They can't even play the notes in the stuff, like the low E, the first line E, right? They can't play. That note is too high for them. All right? That note is too high for them. That's how low their range is. I use this same, the, the, the concepts in the one range book. I use those concepts for those students. Some of those students have ended up being my best players because they that struggle that they had in the beginning they learned how to play high because for them everything was high so they learned how to improve their range now they didn't have that book that book is only it's less than a year old now okay um but yeah that book <clears throat> The concepts of that book are, are have helped students that have no range at all, unusually low ranges. And by the time they're um, sixth grade, they're playing at a high school level. So anyway, let's move on to the next question. Um, at what point of your playing could you play C above the staff? Could you when you were a freshman? No, I could not. This is from ACAC. Um, my, my story about range is kind of uh, a funny story, really. Um, in high school, in fact, let me tell you this. My buddy, John Glass and I, um, John passed away a couple years ago, um, but the two of us used to practice a lot together in high school, and we had a pact. We were going to we were going to prove that you could make Texas All State band without a high C. We want we set out to prove to everybody that you could make. Texas high school band without being able to play a high C. And we both made all state. He made it three times. I made it twice. And I did not have a high C in high school. In fact, what year would it be? Let's see. Three years of college. I struggled with high C. It's so, like, my second year of college, I could get the note, but it was awful. It felt bad. It was, the whole thing was just awful, and it hurt, right? So, no, I struggled with range all those years. And that was part of why I changed the stuff that I changed. You know, all of my books are based all of the physical books are based on, on the changes I made in 1985. 
I went through those changes in 85. I started te teaching those changes in 86, 87. When I got here to Houston in 88, it was pretty much systematic. I wrote the first book in 1990. And that book has been helping students all over the world. We get sales all over the world. We got people um, writing in to thank, thank me for the books because the books work. And, uh, you know, and it's all because I couldn't play high C. <laughs> it all goes back to that because I, there was my embouchure, and, and I think the embouchure, now that I have time to look back, I think my embouchure was bad because the stuff I was practicing was not right. And if I had... Of course, that didn't exist yet. There were some things that were similar back then, but if I had my system back then, none of this would have happened, okay? I wouldn't have had any problems. I would probably be a famous trumpet player by now. <laughs> All right, so here's another question from ACAC. So if you can over-practice mouthpiece buzzing, how long and how much of it should I do? Well, mouthpiece buzzing is a little different, okay? Because you can do two kinds of mouthpiece buzzing. There's the mouthpiece buzzing where you're doing exercises as part of a warm-up, okay? And then there's the other kind of mouthpiece exercises that you use to help you learn how to play music, okay? So let's say, for example, I have some tricky passage um, I'm just going to make something up. Let's say I have, right? Let's say I have something like that. And I'm cracking some of the notes. I might lip buzz it. I mean, mouthpiece buzz it. I might lip buzz it, uh, a mouthpiece buzz it over and over again. And in fact, this is why we use those Buzz aids. Let me go grab a buzz aid real quick. So these are cool little devices. The mouthpiece goes in. And then that little part goes into the horn. So you can be buzzing the mouthpiece. And then you can go back to the horn. Right? And then you can back again. And you can tell that I'm missing the pitch, right? So you, you, go, you go back to the horn. And then back to the like that again right and you just do that until the notes stop cracking really is what what you do now that's a different kind of mouth and you can do as much of that as you want to okay there's no limit to that but as part of your routine if you're doing and I have, you know, I, I, let me see here. I have on my structure for these books. You know, I don't, when I write these books, I don't just um, write whatever I feel or whatever. This is all planned out. This is all very much planned out. So. At the, if you're looking at lip uh, mouthpiece exercises, I'm 
I'm looking at my chart here. In a 40-minute routine, this will give you an idea of how much you should do. Give or take, right? It doesn't have to be exactly like this. In a 40-minute routine, this is a warm-up that lasts 40 minutes long. In a 40-minute routine, oh, now I forgot what, it, what the number was. Oh, 10. In a 40-minute routine, you do 10 lip uh, mouthpiece buzz exercises. Let that sink in. In a 40-minute routine, you do 10 mouthpiece exercises. <laughs> can I play Amazing Grace? Yes, I can play Amazing Grace. You know, I have a, a an arrangement of Amazing Grace um, for just solo trumpet by itself. That wasn't it. <laughs> that wasn't it. It was kind of close to it, but that wasn't it. Um, but I have this this um, this. You know, when I first wrote that arrangement, it was I was playing at a lot of churches. How much was this cornet? You mean price-wise? It's not a cornet, first of all. It's a trumpet. So, um, so actually, I want I can tell you what it costs. It's a prototype. So this was the first one of its kind. So it's it's a P. It's a P5. I'll put the website. And I think he's changed the name. I think he changed the name to Mod. He used to call it P5, now it's called a mod. If you look on his website, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a link to his website. And look at the one called mod. Those are actually pictures of my horn. The pictures he uses on the website are are this instrument, this very instrument. So if you want, if you want um, this uh, uh, a copy of this very instrument, that's the one you would get is the mod. Okay, I love this horn. So vibrato, he's asking, how do you do vibrato with your jaw? 
Um, you know, I get my students to say wah 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 wah. Yeah, so, you know, say say w a w a wah 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 wah. That's kind of how I do it on the horn. I'm actually like. Yeah, I don't know how, how else to say it besides that. You know, the biggest thing with vibrato when you first start learning it is to make sure that the air is consistent. Support it really well because there's a tendency when you start moving your jaw up and down or, or moving this, moving, you know, trying to do it with your hand, there's a, con there's a tendency to do... Um, there's a tendency to do uh, to to cut the air back and and not support it. So yeah. Anyway, what else? What else? Do you guys have any other questions? These were good questions today. So, all right, so if there's no, how fast can you play all scales? Two octaves. Well, I haven't done, let me tell you about my attitude towards scales. Yes, Kwaku, I would suggest the Chops Express the, for the, um, if you practice an hour a day, then the Chops Express. See, we don't want to practice. We don't want to practice only exercises. So you do the Chops Express, and then you practice other music. Okay? Uh, Chops Express and other music. And you can treat the Chops Express like a warm-up. It's not really a warm-up, but you can do that. Um, what kind of music? So... Uh, well, it, you can practice any, you know what you could do, <laughs> you know, every time I do these, it sounds like I'm trying to advertise something. I have on my YouTube channel and I'm going to, I'm going to get the, the, a, actually, you know, what would be better is if I send you a link from my website. Uh, let's see here. I have play-alongs, believe it or not. Let me put that on there. So, well, you can do hymns, too. You say that you like to play for church. Um, you can practice hymns. I don't know if you, you know, nowadays it doesn't, you don't know if people even do hymns anymore. But um, but you can practice hymns. Um, that's that's something that you can practice during that time. Now, what I just put up there now is a link to my playalongs. Now the playalongs, you click on them and they have the notes on the screen, and it's all the way down to the lowest level. I've got. Let me see how many. One, two, three, four, five at the lowest level. One, two, three, four at the next level. I, I'm, I'm going to be beefing these up a little bit more later. Um, but they're clearly arranged in order of difficulty. And you just click on the link. The video comes up. You click play, and you can play along with it so that you have um, – and the – you're playing with me. <laughs> so you and I get to play duets and trios and quartets together. Okay, so, um, yeah, I invite you to go to that page and, and enjoy playing along with me. These are Most of these are recordings that I did that are either on my albums or on my YouTube videos. And I, 
I went through and I took one of the parts out, usually the first part, and you can play along with it. So, and most of them have, not all of them, but most of them have Christian themes. So, um, yeah, they're not all Christian themes, but most of them are Christian themes. Like I have one called Holy is His Name, um, Healing Prayer, Come Shepherds Rise. Uh, I have a whole suite of Christmas themed stuff. I have an Easter fanfare, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, this is this is stuff that you can enjoy working on. Oh, good. Thank you. Oh, great. Very good. Well, thank you. He's Kwaku is saying that he's bought uh, three of our arrangements. So that's wonderful. Oh, I was about, I forgot to finish up about the scales. Sorry. AC, AC. How did I get distracted from that? Let me see. You said, how can, how fast can I play all the scales? I was about to tell you about the scales. Sorry, I don't know what I, how I got distracted. Um, so, so with the scales, I, first of all, I don't believe in scales. I don't like scales. I don't practice scales. What I call scales are really not scales, they're scale patterns, okay? And I don't believe in practicing them fast. I can play fast, um, but I don't believe in practicing them fast. So what I do instead of scales are scale patterns. So, and I'll give you a rundown of those patterns now. So the first one is three notes. I'll just do it in a short range. Okay, then I'll do the opposite of that. I'll do three notes going down. Then I'll do number three, which is up and down. Then down and then up. Then I'll do four notes. And all those variations for four notes. Then I'll do thirds. And then I'll do all those four, four variations. And then, um, then I'll do fourths. I'll do four variations of that. Then I'll do triads. And I'll do four variations of that. How high can I go doing those? So how high can I go is higher than super C. So I'll do that for you now just to show you. So let's say I, I, I was doing the the um, our, the triads. I'll do the next one for the triads. practice that high anymore okay so um, the highest I practice anymore is up to G above the staff so like to here so 
That's as high as I practice anymore. And by the way, this is with my big mouthpiece. So that's why it sounds uh, thinned out out there. I practice with my biggest mouthpiece because it's harder. Then when I go to the gig, I put this in because it's easier. What mouthpiece do I play on? So um, when I'm practicing, I play on a Shoki F1, which is basically like a, a flugelhorn mouthpiece. And then um, on the gig, It depends on the gig though, but most gigs I play on this. And this is the mouthpiece that's not available anymore. In fact, the guy, a lot of people say that they, they this is a terrible mouthpiece. I'll show you the difference. So those notes up there are kind of washed out on the big mouthpiece. On this mouthpiece, they're not washed out. Okay, so they're, they're much more clean and distinct on this mouthpiece because it's a shallow mouthpiece. That's what it's for. You know, it gets, and I, I shouldn't say that's, uh, that, uh, forgive me, I didn't mean to say it that way. It's not for playing high. Okay, the mouthpiece is not for playing high. The, the mouthpiece is for getting that brilliant sound, and that's what makes, the brilliant sound is what makes the notes sound clean in the upper register, okay? Joseph asks, hey, Eddie, recently I made the Texas All-State Band and wanted to know if you could give me insight on the All-State Chair audition process. Yeah, do you know what I'll just say is it's not a big deal. <laughs> Most people don't care about that. So I, I, you know, if you're prepared, there's a chance you could be like up at the top of the section. Really, because most of the people, that they don't take that part of it seriously. The way most people are, they made all state. It's a done deal for them. And you know what? You know what happens? And, and of course, this I might be talking about you. I hope not. <laughs> but there's some people that they put all their eggs in that basket, right? That's how they made all state was they lived and breathed that music. And a lot of times they get the other music for the chair test. Now, I don't know how it is today. I haven't been part of that process since I was in high school, back in the old days. Um, but in those days, we auditioned on the music we were going to play. And I'm assuming it's probably the same way now, and not the same etudes that we played before. And a lot of times, the guys that did so well in the auditions to get into all state aren't actually all that good of a player and don't do so well on the next audition when they get there. I hope that makes sense. Well, congratulations, by the way, on making Allstate. That's a great, that's a good deal, right? That's, that's good. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, any other questions? I hope that answered your question. Any other questions? If not, we'll be going. I'm glad we moved to Friday night. Now, I will have some gigs coming up soon. And if they're early enough, I'll just have to not do the, the, the chat. But for now, it's working out. All right, so very good, everybody. Thank you for hanging out with me.
Um, I always love talking trumpet, huh? That's, <laughs> I think I irritate people sometimes because, you know, we'll be on a gig. Last thing people want to talk about on the gig is more trumpet stuff, you know, but that's how I am. I like talking music. I like, like talking about trumpet. Um, you know, if I didn't like this stuff, I wouldn't be doing it, right? So, you know, I mean, this is this is actually a, a good good thing for me. Anyway, um, thanks for hanging out. God bless you guys, and we'll see you on the next video. Joseph asks if he could send me a video of him playing some of the excerpts. Yes, put that. Make a if you since you have a YouTube channel, put it on your channel. Send me a, a link and I'll watch it. Okay, no problem. Very good. All right, we'll see you guys next time. Good night.